some charcoal, thought you might uh, want to see my process in uh, charcoal production. So I kind of have everything set up here to uh, take you through all the way from start to finish, other than cutting the tree down, which I've already done. So um, this is my chopping block, and it just happens to be the last piece of polonia left that still has bark on it. So I thought I'd demonstrate that first, and I'll take you through each step of the process as rapidly as I can and show you what I do. So first thing uh, with the polonia, it's uh, got a skinny bark. I use my draw knife and, um, and basically pull all the bark off of it. I try to get the bark and the cambium layer. So I'm down to raw wood. So that give you an idea. I don't want to spend all day on debarking wood for you, but just so you can see what it actually entails to remove the bark. All right, so once you have all the bark removed, then it's time to make splits. So. Let me take you over to the wood pile and I'll show you how I make splits. Go. Okay, so you can see I've got a whole pile of splits. I'm using these 16 gallon drums as uh, retorts and they're 24 inches tall. So the first thing I do is I cut all my logs to 23 and a half inches so that way they fit down in the drum evenly. And, uh, and then you can see I make my splits and I try to get all my pieces of wood to a uh, consistent thickness um, somewhere between uh, one and a half to three quarter inch in, in any direction um, square and then uh, and then the 23 and a half inches long so I start just by splitting these just to make them a little bit easier on my on my saw I don't have to do quite as many cuts and as you can see when you have a straight grain in the polonia it doesn't take a great deal of effort to split it and keep in mind this wood is green it was just harvested um, a week ago so that's that now let me take you to the bandsaw and I'll show you that yep okay so here I'm at the bandsaw after I've made those splits like that and I'm continuing to break them down into even smaller pieces I just run them through the bandsaw. And as you can see, that's a dirty mess. So after they've been cut down like that, I take them in my 16 gallon drum. And I start loading them in on an angle like this. I try to now these are not all exactly the same uh, dimension, obviously, and some of them are thicker than others. So I try to put the thicker ones towards the outside wall of the can, and then I fill this completely, trying to avoid having any voids, uh, large air spaces inside. So I reduce the uh, opportunity for ash to develop and have hot spots. So once that's uh, once all those pieces are in and you got the barrel full, then um, it's ready to go into the uh, fire. So I'll take you over and show you that. Okay, so you can see here, I actually have two 55 gallon drums and inside I have two 16 gallon retorts, one in each 55. Um, I have a lid on them and you can see the smoke or actually that's the volatile gases from the polonia inside the can that's being burnt off. And I'm uh, filling the void between the two cans with um, my fuel wood which happens to be whatever scrap wood that I can get my hands on sometimes it's uh, the tree service guys 
um, I stop and I ask them, you know, instead of grinding that and having to dispose of it, can you let me have that wood? And, and I bring my trailer and I drop it off and they fill it up and then I drag it home and then I have to bust it up. So this is what I end up doing. The pieces have to be of a, of a general size for this to uh, be the easiest to control the fire. So first I have to cut every log and piece into long pieces and you can see over there I have uh, a big pile of cherry logs that there was actually some trees that I took down for, uh, for a client and those will end up cutting into uh, somewhere between six and eight inch lengths and then split into about three, uh, four inches maximum so that they fit around the perimeter of these two drums. Um, once uh, I have a fire going and I put these in the drums, I keep uh, maintaining a level of wood around the perimeter of about um, somewhere around uh, a quarter to a half of the way full at the bottom. You don't want a roaring fire, but you do want a fire that is uh, hot in somewhere in the range of about 750 degrees. So, whew. I'll maintain this and uh, generally, right now I'm working with green polonia. So because it's green, it's wet, has a lot of moisture in it. And so it takes time to dry that moisture off as well as it takes time to burn off and drive out the volatiles that are coming out of the wood itself. So if the, if the wood was, was uh, put into splits and then dried over a period of time, a month or two, then it would take about an hour and a half to cook one pot. Um, being that it's green and wet, it takes about two hours. So it's about another half an hour of feeding fires for each can. Each can will produce about five pounds of charcoal. So I run two at a time, about every two hours, I rotate. So come on over here. These two cans here have already come out of the fire uh, about a half an hour ago and they're very hot. I take these uh, galvanil plates that I have, they're just some leftover plates from a uh, manufacturing process, and I lay them on top of the barrels and that actually starves the can of oxygen. If you look at the ones in the fire, you can see that there is a a gap all the way around the edge of the can and that allows the volatile gases to escape and you can see this one is the smoke is starting to generate in moments from now that's going to burst into flames like this one is now the volatile gases are actually starting to light uh, that means the temperature is at optimal temperature um, from my perspective somewhere around like i said 750 degrees internal in the can um, this one is uh, smoking now, so that's a lot of moisture still coming with it, but it's also about to uh, escape. So as those volatile gases come out, oxygen goes in, and uh, what we want to do is starve the oxygen from the internal uh, burning of the wood or charring of the wood. So that's what these lids do. I put them on top. They just set on there. They're very kind of heavy, and uh, they smother uh, the cans, and they have to sit for about an hour and a half to two hours and uh, that it completely extinguishes the cooking process and the uh, charcoal um, remains charcoal instead of turning into ash. And that's at about probably 95% of all the volatiles cooked out of it for uh, this particular charcoal. So now that it's done like that, let me take you over and show you what I do with it to uh, prepare it for grinding. Okay, so here's the barrels. Um, you can see the charcoal is completed and I, I start by pouring it out into this tray. This tray's already full from the last barrel. There's small amounts of ash, and there's also the potential for, these are steel drums, so there is a potential for some of the uh, scale on the cans to end up in the charcoal. So the first thing I do is I put it in and I shake it down. I, I knock it around. I help ensure that I knock down any possibility of any medical metal uh, or uh, any of the um, scale from being on the surface and also it helps to knock off the ash and uh, and clean the charcoal but you can see this charcoal and it sounds like kind of like broken glass when it bangs together and you can see how it it snaps and it's very easy to snap but it's not soft so that's about perfectly cooked charcoal. So from there, I only skim off the top and I transfer it into this bag. 
I want to only transfer it from the top because again, I want to make sure there's there's nothing, there's no possibility of me getting any of those uh, scale particles from the cans in the charcoal. So periodically, I'll shake to the, uh, and I, would, I do this with a dust mask on, by the way, my dust mask, you can see um, what it looks like. I'm only doing this so that during the video you can actually hear me. So uh, I'll transfer this all to this bag, and then from the bag, I'll go to the grinder. So let me take you over there and show you that. All right. Okay, so here we are at the grinder. You can see that um, what I have here is a stainless steel sink with a garbage disposal. This is a uh, kind of a heavy-duty garbage disposal. It's a one horsepower. It's a dry run uh, garbage disposal, so that means it doesn't need any water to cool the motor and for it to operate. Um, so I take my charcoal from this bag, which has been sifted and sorted, and now once again, in the bag, the uh, any potential particles stay in the bottom of the bag and I pour off the top and I put that inside. Um, what's happening is the uh, charcoal is going to go through the grinder. I'm going to force it into the grinder. The grinder is going to uh, have it escape out the bottom and into a five gallon bucket. If you want to look and see how the piping on that works, this just goes down. I've got a wet rag wrapped around the uh, opening on the uh, can to keep the dust from migrating out of the can. And uh, once that's full, it's kind of evident, dust starts flying out of the top and you know your can is full and then I just swap it out for another one and keep grinding. So let me show you that. process. So once it's all ground, uh, if you come out here and look, I've got these uh, these barrels already filled. <clears throat> and then this is what you end up with. You have a nice, very fluffy, almost liquid-like powder. Um, very fine. There's uh, probably a 10 Maybe a 12 mesh uh, is probably the largest particle down to air float in that bucket. So that's a, a really nice charcoal to work with, um, particularly going from this to a ball mill or, um, <clears throat> or even just screening it and uh, going right to making uh, whatever formula you want with a uh, coarse charcoal.